And here we go. Who was Thomas Blackston? You know, as a youth, I spent a month each summer in Waterton, and I knew all the landmarks, the mountains, including Blackiston. I knew the name. I knew there was a falls. I knew there was a valley. I knew there was a creek. But I had no idea who was Thomas Blackiston. In Lethbridge today, there's all kinds of Blackistons showing up. Just lately, they had a university residence now called Mount Blackston House. We have a park. We have streets. Again, how many people really know who Thomas Blackston was, or even if he was a person? Well, I became intrigued, and here's his story. One day I was going through the Buchanan Library, at the, that's a section of the Lethbridge Public Library, and I found this volume, Explorations of Two Passes of the Rocky Mountains, by Captain T.W. Blackiston. I was intrigued. As I started to read it, I realized he was describing all these landmarks in such vivid description, and that it was an area that really hadn't changed very much as far as I could see. And so I really started to take this quite seriously and decided that it would be great to try to retrace his route and see exactly what it was through his eyes. And you can look at the map here. This is now a provincial park, and this is the route to the North Kootenai Pass. And here's the story. The Trek students that I was working with at the time, we had started out by retracing mounted police stories, but I got them involved, and we worked on a production which we distributed to um, all kinds of schools. I'm not sure how many hundred or so schools throughout um, Alberta and uh, parts of BC that tied in with the story of Thomas Blackston. Slide tape production it was in those days. So here's the story. He goes back to 1832. His father um, seemed to be quite a brilliant fellow. This particular home he designed in uh, England. And uh, he was a minor aristocrat. He had been an uh, engineer in the uh, army in India. He taught his son, uh, as I recall, uh, this particular Thomas. He was uh, younger than the rest of the family, and there was quite a spread in the family. And his father homeschooled him, basically, and taught him math at a very, very early age. And uh, eventually, uh, as was the, the way it was in those days, if you could get yourself a position in the army, a uh, commission of such, uh, this was the a status symbol. And he became a cadet in uh, the Royal Artillery, which I guess would be the, the army, what we would call the army. And he was, in 1851, he was sent over to Nova Scotia, to Halifax. He served two years. Uh, when he was younger, his father used to be quite a hunter, and he would uh, go out with him and shoot birds. And Thomas became quite interested in the, how the birds differed. And he had a memorization of the birds in the area. And when he got to Nova Scotia, he started to uh, study the birds in that area. And eventually... He uh, kept notes, and uh, he contacted the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, uh, which was the place to house birth stories in uh, uh, North America. He served then next in the Crimean War, and uh, this was a, a battle between the United Kingdom and the Russians and the Bulgarians, uh, quite a famous war. I believe this is the where the story of Florence Nightingale originates. And uh, at this point, he was not just fighting, he was also collecting bird samples and studying them and wondering why the birds in the Crimea were different from the birds in uh, England. On his return from the Crimea, he found that his scientific work there had got him some notice, and he was uh, asked to uh, take part in a North American uh, project uh, he met the people up on the uppy-ups, 
And uh, his job, because of his mathematical skills, was to uh, observe the uh, magnetic fields in various parts of the country. As, uh, this man, Sabine, Sabine uh, was studying, uh, had a global project of mapping the Earth's magnetic fields. So Blackson's job was to take readings uh, all across uh, the Canada that he was working in. The project was under the control of Captain John Palliser, um, and it became a scientific expedition. And here are the people that were involved in it. There was Dr. James Hector, which we've talked about before. Yeah, Eugene Bougeau, he was in, uh, interested in the botany of the area. Secretary was John Sullivan, he kept all the records. And Blackston being the astronomical and magnetical observer. He landed up in Fort Carlton, which is in the center of Saskatchewan. And he came by way of York Factory in Norway House. And uh, the reason he came this way was because he had these delicate instruments that uh, he had to worry about, and this seemed to be the safest way to uh, get them there uh, most gingerly without an accident. Uh, when we took the Trek students to that area back in the 70s, uh, they had rebuilt Fort Carlton, and uh, we could see the... Uh, remains of it, the old foundations along the riverbank. And of course, uh, in the picture on the right, you can see the uh, rebuilt fort. In the center picture is Corny Martins, who was the artist on our trek. And this is his version, uh, simply a watercolor of the area. After spending the winter in 1857-58 at Fort Carlton, uh, Blackston, in his spare time, had uh, publi he published the observations of a hundred bird species and uh, many others that he uh, had spotted along the way. Uh, and this became a valuable study in the pre-settlement of the bird life on the prairies. Okay, so then it was time to start exploring the mountains. And... Uh, they started this particular part of their work at Old Bow Fort, which is on the way to Banff near Rosetta. And uh, it's now just a, a prairie, hardly anything identifiable. And uh, from there they went down south, along past where Longview is today. And uh, as they approached the Old Man River, he looked towards the mountains, which, by the way, the mountains, as you can see from the center picture, uh, they're all sort of a straight line. He notes the fact the gap shows this amazing dome-shaped mountain, which he names Gould's Dome, after uh, John Gould, who was uh, an ornithologist and had all kinds of lavish pictures of birds, uh, which, of course, enticed uh, our friend. And he then went on, and he also named the mountains, the Livingston Mountains, not Livingstone as we seem to pronounce it now, but Livingston as David Livingston. And you can see from his journal the way he has spelt it at the bottom. I therefore gave the whole the name of Livingston's Range. This is what he said. He said, looking through the gap in the near range through which the river issues, I saw a very decided dome-shaped mountain. After the distinguished British naturalist, I named it Gould's Dome. The gap through which I had seen this mountain was in an eastern near range, a very regular form extending, with the exception of this gap, for a distance of five and twenty miles, without a break. The crest of the range was so regular a form that no point did be selected as a peak. I therefore gave the whole the name of Livingston's Range. In 1858, Blackston proceeded to explore the southern Canadian Rockies to determine their possibilities as routes for a railway. Approaching the Rockies, he followed the traditional route used by the natives, that is, the North Kootenai Pass. 
But the interesting part of this story is he came up with this. He said, with two mountain ranges to go over, all that would be required, he felt, would be a five-mile tunnel, a three-mile tunnel, and a ten-mile incline railway. So that would be a railway which would be pulled up the engines with a, a stationary engine at the top, pulling up by cables these cars. Very interesting. Only a few miles to the north of his route lay a pass, no mountain to go over, the crow's nest. Ironically, the crow's nest would arguably turn out to be the best pass for a railway in the whole of the Canadian Rockies. The question arises, why did he not think of checking out the crow's nest pass? His map shows that he knew it existed. In his journal, he states, by the report of the natives, it is a very bad road and seldom used. The answer seems to lie in a classic case of people just not communicating, and as a result, the perfect pass for a railway would not be discovered for another 15 years. To the Indians, a good road was one that was free of fallen timber, which made walking difficult. A slope was no problem at all. On the other hand, Blackston required a route with little slope. The amount of windfall would make no difference. So, in 1982, as I said before, I was so intrigued by this particular report. In 1982, I came up with the idea of taking a group up to the top of the North Kootenai Pass and putting a plaque to honor Blackston and the fact that this was an early Indian route through the Rockies. So we had a lot of publicity on the Terry Bland show and elsewhere in the newspaper. And we got quite the crowd that came up to unveil this plaque. Here's some newspaper articles. The Great Axis of America. And we had the buglers, we had lots of people, we had the flag, the old British flag before the unveiling, and the guy with no pants. Now, we were now on the watershed of the mountains, and these are, these are his words, and they're so, so great. We were now on the watershed of the mountains, the great axis of America. A few steps further, and I gave a loud shout as I caught the first glimpse in a deep valley, as it were, at my feet, of a feeder of the Pacific Ocean. It was the Flathead River, a tributary of the Columbia. At the same moment, the shots of my men's guns echoing among the rocks announced the passage of the first white man over the Kootenai Pass. And then he goes on. This is no place for a dissertation on the physical geography of North America, but I may simply state that in that portion of the Rocky Mountains comprised between the parallels of 40, 45 degrees and 54 degrees north latitude rise the four great rivers of the continent, namely the Mackenzie, running north to the Arctic Ocean, the Saskatchewan, east to Hudson's Bay, the Columbia, west to the Pacific, and the Missouri, south to the Gulf of Mexico. Thus we may say that in a certain sense that portion of the mountains is the culminating point of North America, and I now, on the Kootenai Pass, stood as nearly as possible in the center of it. And there you can see a chart of the different river systems. We gave each person that was on the walk a, a certificate, and we had them sign showing that they were on the historic trail walk. Almost 40 years later, I was happy to discover our marker was still pointing out to those who passed by the history of the area. And yes, no bullet holes in it at all. Blackston's map. Here's the map that shows what it, where the locations are today of where he was when he was on his trip. Blackston traveled west over the North Kootenai Pass to Tobacco Plains and returned by way of the South Kootenai Pass. 
the whole traditional trade route of the old southern Rockies. Blackson named the Galton Range after the English scientist and explorer, Sir Francis Galton. He told me that there was a pass entering the mountains a little to the southward of our camp and which came out on the east side near the chief's mountain. That there were long hills, but not so steep as in the Kootenai Pass, and that they used it sometimes when the horses were heavily loaded. This information of another pass in the portion of the mountains that I knew should be explored caused me at once to decide to recrossing the mountains by this path. Although I knew that it would be wholly or partially on American ground, I therefore prevailed upon the Kootenai to accompany the party across as a guide. From there he went, following the south of the Tobacco Plains along the Galton Range, then over the U.S. border and turning northwest at Grave Creek and followed the old Kootenai Indian Trail, eventually arriving at South Kootenai Pass. Then down the Blackson Valley, where he arrived and named Waterton Lakes. I recently discovered a, a watercolor that interested me. It was made on July 29, 1861, and it uh, is by Charles William Wilson of the British Boundary Commission, a fellow that I had talked about before in an early production on the place names of Waterton. Uh, and he had made a sketch from the top of the uh, South Kootenai Pass, uh, from the same location, that I took the picture on the right. And uh, it's interesting to compare the two. Anyway, in 1858, Blackson was again at Fort Carlton. And here you see the picture uh, drawing sketch of the original and the reproduction on the right. And in 1859, he returned to England um, with a comprehensive list of all the magnetic observations that he had been asked to take, as well as specimens of birds that he had collected along the route of his trip in North America. On the way, he stopped at the Smithsonian, which is the Natural History Museum in Washington, and uh, he talked to them about his collection, met important people in the uh, business of birds, 1860, his regiment was sent to Canton, China, to protect the British interests as there was a civil war going on. And uh, he got carried away a bit, and he and a number of others decided to go on a little trip up the Yangtze River. And their, their goal was to eventually get to India, but when they got up the river, uh, very, very far. He went 900 miles further than any Westerner had ever gone before, before they were forced to turn back to Shanghai. And uh, they collected all kinds of goodies on the way, birds and plants and so on that he was interested in. Um, but they had to turn back. And uh, when he got back to England, he wrote a book about all the things that he saw and because of the collection he had made and then the work he had done on the Yangtze River, uh, after it was published, uh, he received the Royal Geographical Society's Gold Medal. And when you glance through the uh, book, uh, you can see the amazing things, discoveries that he made along the way. And you can see a, uh, on this screen here a partial map that he uh, made of the whole area going up the Yangtze River. So that alone was, was quite an achievement. Now looking at a map, we're now in Japan. After he left China, he went across Siberia, and the scuttlebutt is that uh, his wife had had enough by this time as they trucked across the uh, Siberia. And uh, remember, in those days, there was no Siberian railway. It was uh, just a matter of um, sleds, I guess. Anyway, his idea was that he was going to uh, mine the lumber. There was all kinds of lumber there that would be needed for uh, homes and boats and ships and all that. And so he went back to uh, England and uh, he purchased three ships and equipment to start up a sawmill back in Russia. But 
He couldn't get permission from the Russian government to do this. So the next spot was to cross the way uh, to northern Japan. And uh, he set up shop at the city of Hakodate. And you can see on the map where it is. It's the bluish green dot there. And uh, the blackest in line is going to, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But uh, he is now known for having discovered that the uh, animal life on the northern island of Japan, which is called Hokkaido, um, is more tied in with the Asia, northern Asia part, because the animals there are completely different, not completely different, but many of them are different than the animals that are across the small area of water between uh, Hokkaido and Honshu, which is the southern island. But we'll talk about that in a few minutes. In the meantime, I visited um, Hakodate, and uh, I went to the old British consulate, uh, which is now dedicated to preserving the Japan's opening to foreign trade. They, they because of Admiral Perry, and uh, there's a whole another story here. Um, but anyway, foreign ships had special privileges, and he had three ships that he had brought over with the equipment on, and as a result. He was able to do a lot for the area that other people couldn't do because he had these special privileges. Anyway, in this museum, you can see some of the stuff that belonged to Thomas Blackston. Here's his rifle. You can see this little, uh, I guess it would be a cardboard um, showpiece here of showing Blackston and part of the, his uh, bird collection. And that's his home also in the picture. Now, there are only two known photographs of Thomas Wright Blackston. And uh, this is him younger when he was 26 or 29, and, and then the older one on the right. In North America, we normally see the one on the left. And in Japan, um, because he was older, you see the right version. And in this uh, museum, um, you saw the workings of his lumbering system that he uh, brought over from England. And then uh, before that, they had none of this mechanization. And uh, a little uh, a picture here of the operation. Unfortunately, uh, although he had this great equipment, they didn't have a way of bringing the lumber to the lumber mill because things were so primitive in the transportation field and eventually he just didn't have enough lumber and it was uneconomical and he had to, um, after a decade or so, um, just give it up as not economical. Anyway, I also went to the Hakodate City Library and presented the sketchbook. During this period in my work, I had a sketchbook project whereby I had the schools uh, all across Canada, but mostly in the western part, who were doing sketches of various explorers that uh, went around the world. And most of the explorers in, the, in that area, Palliser, Hector, and so on, uh, were Brits who uh, did extensive exploration all around the world. And so I would do these, uh, to collect these sketches, the kids would, uh, I would send out the parts of the journal. They would do the sketches based on these uh, journal entries and send them to me and I put them in the book form and then uh, gave me an excuse to travel to various places in the world to make presentations of our Canadian children's sketches. Uh, a lot of them were very uh, imaginative and uh, a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun project. It really was. Anyway, I did a pre presentation to uh, the man at the uh, uh, museum in Hakodate, and he was kind enough to uh, let me see the artifacts that were part of the collection of Thomas Blackston, including this uh, monocular scope. Now, on the top right, you'll see a picture of uh, the kids looking through one of the sketchbooks. This was a sketchbook that I presented to students in Sapporo. 
and uh, it was great fun. Also in Hakodate, there's signs about Blackston. This is the remains of his weather station that he set up. That it became an open port because of the fact that these foreigners could bring their ships in, and it became quite an important port in the northern part of Japan, but they had no way of um, trying to figure out what the weather was going to be like, and remember the ships in those days were sailing, had sails, and so uh, this was a problem, and Blackston introduced the modern met meteorological techniques, uh, and this is a sign that I found in the town talking about his contribution. Why was Blackson held in such high regard in Japan then? We've already touched upon some of it. He brought mechanization to the lumber industry. He brought new instruments from England and introduced meteorology. When Hakodate became an open port, the foreign ships had special privileges which helped when they uh, need, had problems in the community. As a soldier, scholar, and businessman, he made the acquaintance of many Japanese and tried in various ways to introduce the Western culture to Japan. Uh, not only that, he loved the land, he visited the remote areas, studied the landscape, documented the birds. He was continually learning as he went along. This is a picture of his home. Obviously, he was doing well. And the fact that he could buy three ships like the one you see here uh, meant that there was money in the family. In fact, they had their own currency. Blackston, um, a man, Akadati, he, this was a partner that, uh, Mars, I think the name is, uh, this was a partner that he partnered up to uh, make his uh, business dealings. 1879, although his time was spent in business, his interest was mainly nature, I think, and he compiled a catalogue of the birds of Japan, which for years was considered the standard work on the birds of Japan. And when I visited Sapporo, I talked to the fellow as best that we could communicate, and uh, he took me and showed me the collection 1,331 specimens. And I believe the specimens that he collected in Canada are located at the um, army at Woolwich, um, where he had trained in the, in the UK. He also gave me a list of the birds. In 1884, Blackston retired from his business interests in Hakodate, Japan. Following a brief visit in Australia, New Zealand, and England, he went to the United States to settle. In um, at 53, in 1885, he married Mary Ann Dunn um, of London, Ohio, and I believe her brother was also a Dunn who is famous in, in, in Hokkaido, so there was a, quite a connection of friendship. And, uh, it, it ended up in marriage. His first, divorce, his first wife had divorced him, uh, so the story goes after the trip to Siberia, but anyway, they were divorced. He married again at 53. And he went to New Mexico to pursue his uh, ornithology. He had then published another book, published The Water Birds of Japan. And he did this for the U.S. National Museum, the Smithsonian. And there are a number of species of birds that uh, are named after him. This is a listing here. And here's one of the favorites, the Blackston Fish Owl named after Thomas Blackston, and the bird is the largest owl and wingspan of six feet or two meters. It's the world's largest. Endangered, there are only about 2,600 remaining in Hokkaido and a few uh, that are off uh, in Russia and China. And it is revered by the Ainu, which are the um, aboriginal people of Hokkaido, the northern island of Japan and they have a feeling that they protect the villages, their villages. Here's a, a book that he wrote talking about Japan and Yezo. Yezo, Yezo is the name uh, which we call today Hokkaido. And uh, he also drew a map of the whole area. And you can see there's a lot of detail. 
And uh, here we talk about the fact that uh, he did the work on uh, showing how the animal life is different on the Northern Island and the Southern Island, and why the difference exists. It's sort of the same idea as that animals in Australia are different than the ones further north. And it's because of the land masses that changed over the um, millions of years. Today there's a monument overlooking, and I hope I get this right, Sugaru Strait, that now is known as the Blackiston Line in scientific circles. And just overlooking that particular strait is this amazing monument honoring Thomas Blackiston. Sadly, in 1891, um, he had settled in the United States, as I mentioned, and he was visiting San Diego and was stricken by pneumonia and died at the age of 58. He is now buried in Columbus, Ohio, and he had been living in um, London, Ohio, and I was able to obtain uh, the articles from the newspaper at the time uh, talking about his death. But people had forgotten. And when I inquired uh, at the place that he had been buried, um, I was told that the people were quite excited because of the fact that that particular graveyard uh, has a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful cemetery, they say, with cascading monuments that you will find anywhere. And the most beautiful, and it's known for its variety of birds and the state champion trees. So. Yeah, it seems like a beautiful spot uh, for Blackson to spend um, the time memorial. The many bird watchers who frequent Green Lawn Cemetery were happy to discover they had a famous naturalist in their midst. Yes, with birds and all it seems, his final resting place is a spot he would have loved. And this is his gravestone. The story of Thomas Blackston. Now you know.